The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to this very special edition of Autism Live on President's Day. Happy President's Day to everybody. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I am, while, the, while you are watching this, I am in a hotel room in San Diego watching it with you because I'm speaking a little bit later on today um, on a panel. Uh, of a parent panel at ABAI, which is uh, their ABAI International. It's the, the governing board for applied behavior analysis for BCBAs. And this is their once a year autism conference that's happening in San Diego. So I'm here speaking on behalf of you and me and a lot of other people that are out there as parents talking to ABA professionals. Uh, which we thought was a pretty important thing to do, but we wanted to make sure we did a show, so we're pre-taping this. But I am watching from the hotel room with you live, so you can be writing in the comments right now, and as long as the Wi-Fi in the hotel is working, you and I can continue to have conversations. We've got a really important topic today, um, and I'm excited to be sharing it with you. Uh, I picked 10 myths about ABA that I wanted to go over with you guys, and this has changed over the years. I've done this talk many times, um, but I, but some of the myths have changed, lo and behold. So I thought it was ideal to talk about this so that we get a basis for what, what we're talking about. But first, I want to say that we're uh, we're live. You're watching it live right now on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and a bunch of other sites. Traven is going to show you what those sites are right now. Don't forget that this show, if you're not able to watch it live, you can always catch the podcast. It's a free download wherever you get your podcasts. And all of our shows, the, the re full recording uh, with the video and everything else goes up on our YouTube channel, which you can find youtube.com slash autism live. You can visit our website. Our main website right now is autismnetwork.com, which is easier to remember, although the autism-live.com is still semi-working, right? But Autism Network is the best place to go, and you can watch all of the shows there. They're archived there. And Traven also edits smaller versions so that you have something easier to catch on our playlist and on autismnetwork.com. You can't find that under podcast. The full shows are in podcast. And usually the podcasts now are audio only, except for stories from the spectrum, which we feel is a very visual medium, and we want you to be able to see and hear that. So it is available as either a video or a audio download. But remember that over on our YouTube channel, we have everything. And I encourage you to subscribe to us, look, right on time, to uh, our YouTube channel because we've got lots of fun stuff coming up. Don't forget that we have fully announced now the... Uh, Autism Network Podcastathon. We are going to do this wild and crazy thing. April 4th at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we are going to go live and we are going to attempt with everything that we have to stay live for 44 hours nonstop live. I know it's a little crazy. We're not doing it by ourselves. We've got all these amazing organizations that are hopping on board. We're going to have some real um, fun takeovers from organizations and people who have their own podcasts are going to take over for an hour and bring you their feed. It's a real coming together of a lot of different people in the autism community. I'm really excited about it. So mark your calendar. It's 44 hours. I, you know, at some point in there, you're going to have downtime. Uh, so make sure that you mark down and, and you know where to find us, right? Okay, a uh, couple of other things. Feel free to be writing in right now because as I said, hopefully if the Wi-Fi is good, I'm in a hotel room and I'm going to be able to write back and forth with you. Because some of this stuff is incendiary and this is my take on it. This is a parent-to-parent -parent talk. So this is my take on it as a parent who went through early intensive behavioral intervention with my son 
And to be abundantly clear, my son was diagnosed at two and a half. We didn't start ABA until he was three. At that time, he was considered for all intents and purposes nonverbal, want to do full disclosure. He could speak some words. At that point, he probably had three to five words, but they weren't for communication. But he did have the ability to utter. Most of what he did was he clicked his tongues, he made little noises, and, um, and he would just babble and spin in circles uh, when we started ABA. And then we started early intensive behavioral intervention at the highest quality. I now understand this to be the highest quality. And I, uh, at that time, there was no insurance funding for it, so I had to be home. Someone from either myself or my husband had to be home, and most often that was me. I had to be home, and I was either participating or watching from the other room on a monitor. I, we couldn't afford for me to do nothing, so I was doing all kinds of work that I could do and be watching and listening to the monitor. So I watched him. I, so I'm not trying to tell people about something that I am not aware of, but... I'm going to give you the asterisk that what I had is not necessarily what other people have because the field is changing. I am not thrilled about that, very outspoken about that. But from my point of view, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions that are out there about ABA. It might, you might be talking about the ABA that you got or the ABA that somebody else got. So putting a disclaimer out there, I'm t telling you from my experience what I, what I had and what I want for other people. Yeah? And we've talked before about what delineates good ABA from bad ABA, at least, you know, we've talked about it. Not enough, but a lot. Okay, so I'm going to run through them really quickly, and then I'm going to go back and talk about each one individually. You ready? Strap in. Ten tips, right? <laughs> ten, top ten myths about ABA right now in 2023. Parent to parent. Okay, here we go. Number one, all ABA is the same. Whoo, it is not. So we're going to talk about that. Myth number two, all ABA is traumatizing. I, I can assure you, and notice that I've said that all ABA is traumatizing is a myth. That doesn't mean that some ABA is traumatizing. So for those of you who are like, no, it's traumatizing, I am not disavowing what you're saying. But I, what I am saying is that all of it is not. That is a myth that all ABA is traumatizing. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into why. Uh, myth number three, that ABA is only effective for high-functioning individuals. We hear this all the time. They said that my child doesn't have language, so ABA would not be effective. That is false. Uh, number four, that ABA is not effective for high-functioning individuals. We are both sides of the argument that they go, oh, your child's too high-functioning. ABA would not be useful to them. I'm going to tell you why that is false. Uh, myth number five, ABA only teaches blind compliance. Well, you know, you could teach that, but it is not what uh, it only teaches. And if you're getting good ABA, it's not going to teach bl blind compliance. So that's a myth. It's false. Myth number six, ABA doesn't utilize natural environment. That's a myth. Uh, it can and it should. Uh, myth number seven, ABA is not child driven. Oh, this makes me want to run screaming with my hair on fire. That is a myth. Maybe there are people who are doing ABA that's not child-driven, but they need to be slapped on the wrist and have their licensure taken away. My feeling. Okay, myth number eight. ABA is only for small children. It's not for teens or adults. That's a myth. That's false. That's a lie. Myth number nine. ABA is only used for autism. Hello? No? We're going to talk about that as well. And myth number ten. Uh, it's kind of two here, but there are people who say that all ABA is bad. That's a myth. That's not true. But it's equally not true that all ABA is good. That is also a myth. I'm going to stand by that truth. I am not an ABA professional. I'm not licensed to do ABA. But I know for a fact that all of it right now in 2023 is not good. I stand by that truth. Okay. And yet, I am a ginormous fan of good ABA. So I, I just want to put that out there. Now, let's go back to the beginning and let's tear through all of these and you'll find out what I mean by each and every one of these things. So number one, all ABA is, is the same. Okay, let me be very clear that ABA is a teaching methodology. That is what it is. It's a method of teaching, and it has been shown to be, th uh, throughout all kinds of studies, it's been shown to be wildly effective 
with a lot of people. It's a set of principles for a teaching methodology. So this would be like saying all teaching is bad or the same or um, you know that every third grade class looks the same uh, or every time um, somebody has ever learned to speak a foreign language it was the same. And I put the, uh, for those of you who are listening in podcasts, the slide here shows a bunch of different tubes of paint that have been squirted out in a rainbow. Because I always talk about the fact that ABA is a set of tools. It's teaching tools to be able to teach anyone, but you would never use the same tools on the same people, which means that the person who's delivering the ABA, it, how it, like any teacher, they're going to bring a piece of themselves to it, and that is going to change how it is. If I were to talk about my fifth grade experience and what it was like for me and, and the teacher that I had who was really into science and really into drawing diagrams, and so what we did all year long is we drew diagrams, like a cross-section of a tooth. Uh, you know, and, and I, there are things that I know because I had the experience of drawing while I was doing it. I'll bet your fifth grade teacher didn't do that. So are we saying that all fifth grade is the same? It's not, because it's very much influenced by the person who is receiving, and it's very much influenced by the person who is giving. And there are all kinds of schools of thought about ABA now. Um, there are people who do, you know, who, who prefer to do more DTT, and there are people who prefer to do more NET, when in truth, they should be using the tools to fit the individual. So. All ABA is not the same, and we cannot paint it with the same paintbrush. It is not all the same. And what, what I'm a big advocate of is that the principles of ABA, and the main principle of ABA is that an individual will, will strive to learn something if it is meaningful to them, and they get meaningful rewards. I love that principle as a teacher because that means that if, if I have chosen something that is meaningful to teach somebody, it's why they go in and they, you know, they don't just teach Shakespeare as Shakespeare anymore and they set Shakespeare in, you know, in, in 2010 because they think it's going to be more interesting to the kids. You gotta, you gotta bring it to them where they are and you have to make it worthwhile. As Dr. Grand Pichet say says, it has to be fair. It has to be fair, which means it's got to be of interest to them, and it's got to be reinforcing and rewarding to them in some way. Uh, those are the principles of ABA that I stand by. I stand by. I, unapologetically, I stand by. Don't worry. We're going to get into this. Okay, myth number two, uh, all ABA is traumatizing. And I said as we did the rundown, I need to say that I, there are many people who have told me now that they have had a, ABA and that it was traumatizing to them. And I, in no way, am disavowing that. I believe them. I 100% believe that the, the story that they are telling. And I am in no way trying to minimize that. But I also want to make room for the fact that there are people who have provided ABA where it wasn't traumatizing. That the problem that I have is when people tell me that ABA is traumatizing and I, and I feel they're grief, that they don't want that to happen to anyone else, and they are afraid that it will happen to someone else. I am too. I am too, but my thing is that if we all work together and understand what happened and why it was traumatizing and work to regulate to make sure that that never happens again, that we don't have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. You know, that I, my experience is that my son, and I re-talked about this with him last night, just to touch base, and, he sa and I said, is there any part of you that at this age, about to be 20, feels that ABA was traumatizing to you? And he said, no, no, it wasn't traumatizing. And he said it like five times. Um, and I was there, I didn't see him be traumatized, um, I, you know, were there days that were harder than others? Yes. Um, you know, I, I think, I didn't ask him about this, but I would think that he would tell you that uh, going through high school during the pandemic was traumatizing. Um, but that ABA, he was very clear, was not. So 
if we make room for the possibility that some ABA has been traumatizing to people and that some ABA has not been traumatizing to people, then what I want to focus my energy on is making sure that we only have experiences where it is not traumatizing. And I am a huge advocate for that, that we never do ABA in a way that it is traumatizing. I think where I diverge from people is that when you've had an experience with something that's traumatizing and you've not seen a way that it's not traumatizing, it doesn't feel like there could be a way that is not traumatizing. I respect that, but I, I respectfully say that I have seen the other side where it is not traumatizing. It is possible. It does happen. It does not have to be traumatizing. Again, main principle, if I make it fun for you, then you will work through whatever is hard because you'll want to learn it. Um, that should not be traumatizing. The very core of what ABA is stipulates that it should not be traumatizing. And yet, some people don't do it that way. And this makes me crazy. And I am with you in that fight to make sure that it is never traumatizing to anybody. It shouldn't be if people follow the principles. Okay, let's move on to the next one. ABA is only effective for high-functioning individuals. I am so saddened when somebody says to me, well, you know, I actually got the diagnosis at two and they told me that's really early uh, and I should be very grateful, but that he doesn't have enough skills to benefit from ABA. I want to run screaming out into the traffic because whoever is telling people that is... I don't know, incompetent or evil, I don't know, because the studies are there and, it, and we, how much have we all been saying for 20 years, early intervention is key, early intervention is key, early intervention is key. This idea that you can't use the principles of ABA on a child that is, does not have a certain number of skills is wildly inaccurate, wildly inaccurate. And the, the truth is, is that we should start as early as possible. And, um, and the functionality of the person, you know, it's not that it doesn't matter. It certainly does matter because it means you're going to start in a different place and, and their learning style is going to be unique to them and you're going to teach to that learning style. But there is no person on the planet that couldn't benefit from ABA. There's no, let me say that again, there is no person on the planet who could not benefit from ABA. Uh, and we're going to talk later about the fact that ABA is not just for autism. It isn't used just for autism. So uh, saying that someone is not high functioning enough to qualify for, for this teaching technique that you can teach anyone, uh, it's just they're going to, you're going to teach at a different rate in a different style. It's maddening. If someone is telling you that your child does not have enough skills for ABA, what they're telling you is they don't have enough skills to know what they're doing. Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. They don't know what they're doing. Studies show that this is false. Okay, the other side of it is I hear people um, saying, you know, that they took their seven-year-old, their seven-year-old got diagnosed, and they say, well, you know, your child has mad skills. Your child can speak, so ABA is not going to be effective for them. This is even more maddening to me because this flies directly in the face of what the best outcomes are in the studies that have been done. It's true that if you are high functioning and whatever skills you have, it kind of makes sense, right? If I'm gonna teach someone how to crochet, uh, right? And they already know how to knit it's not the same skill at all, but they have some skills. They know how to handle the yarn. They've already got the counting. I'm going to start in a different place than someone who has never, ever done anything with a needle or yarn, right? And it might be that the person who's never had any works so hard that they bypass the person who was a knitter. That's entirely possible. But it's also possible that I'm going to, since I'm going to be starting at a further place along the line, that if that person is getting good instruction and getting often enough instruction, that they will just fly, that they will just fly because I was able to start further along. So this, this myth that your child is too high functioning to benefit from ABA, please check the studies. The studies say the exact opposite. 
what I think is cruel and unconscionable is when people, two things actually, when people say, oh, you know, this person is a 1-1. One, one. They, they were diagnosed with a 1-1 one, one when they got their autism, which means that they need um, minimal support. But the very definition of a 1 means that they need support. And so to say to them, oh, you're so high functioning, you, you do qualify for the disorder, and it says here that you need support, but we don't think you need it. What is that? That is beyond stupid. Um, I'm sorry, that's not the technical term for it, but it's beyond stupid. By the very definition, they need some support. And, and early intervention counts for them as well. If early intervention means coming in at 7, it's much better than coming in at 14. But if 14 is when you got the diagnosis and you got a 1-1, then get it then. It's that thing about when is now a good time. When the first moment that you get the diagnosis, getting support is the time. And um, we're going we're gonna to go over this myth in a minute, but that you're going you're gonna to approach it differently with a 3-year-old than you are with a 14-year-old because they're different. And if it's individualized, then you would go about it differently. And if somebody is trying to teach your 14-year-old with the same messages, methods that they're teaching the 3-year-old, wave goodbye to them. They are not doing the good ABA. And it could be traumatizing for, to a 14-year-old to be taught in the way that a 3-year-old is. These should all be duh moments to people in the community um, that are professionals. And yet, I find that I have to explain this to them as well. But for parents, we don't know. We don't know. Somebody tells us this, and we don't know, right? Um, okay, uh, here's one that we covered the other day with Dr. Grampuche that somebody wrote in and said, is it true that ABA will make your child fodder for you know, the bad people and the molesters and people like that because it teaches them blind compliance. And I loved her answer to it that, it, you know, it's about what are you teaching. And if somebody is not doing good ABA, yes, absolutely, they could be teaching blind compliance. That is not my experience of ABA, and it should not be anybody's experience of ABA. My child was actually taught how to say no when he didn't want to do something, even to the person working with him. That if they were like, okay, now we're going to sit down and we're going to work on this, he had the ability to say, no, I don't want to work on that. And he was, you know, taught how to express himself. And, and at different stages, it was different things that he could point to something and ask for something else, or that later on he could speak and say, and, and then much later on, he could negotiate and say, you know, uh, I'd like a break first. Or, you know, I, just like we negotiate, if your boss comes to you and says, I'm going to add all this work to you and I need you to be here for the weekend, you know, you come back and say, okay, I'm willing to be here for the weekend, but I need time off next Wednesday. That'll make it worthwhile for me to be here for the weekend, right? So my son was taught all those negotiation skills to make it fair for him. Remember that phrase of Dr. Grampuche, it has to be fair. And teaching blind compliance to people is not fair. It's not the principles of ABA. It's bad, schlocky, lazy ABA to just get compliance. Um, don't do that. Don't do bad, schlocky ABA. But don't confuse that with all ABA, right? It's a myth. It doesn't, all ABA does not uh, teach blind compliance. Here's another one. Myth number six, ABA doesn't utilize the natural environment. And, you know, a lot of people believe this with their very whole heart and soul and being. They're like, oh, kids just sit there and they, you know, they, they say touch car and that's all they do. Because um, when they do touch car, I mean, that's, a, that's DTT. I don't want to get too much into jargon. Watch the channel for that. But uh, there are many ways to teach something. Many, many, many ways to teach something. And there are many ways to start to begin teaching something. But how you start to begin teaching something is not how you teach it completely. I always talk about ballet. When you go in to do ballet, like you go to take a ballet class and what you want to do is do that thing where they leap across the stage and they look elegant and they float through the air, right? That's what we all want 
if we want to do uh, ballet, we want to get that air. Uh, I used to watch Barishnikov jump when I was a kid uh, live. He would come to a, a local theater all summer long. I, I lived in Saratoga, New York, and we would, you know, pay to sit on the lawn and watch Barishnikov jump to see how high he could go. That's what we want, right, when we go to ballet classes. But you don't walk in and they go, all right, let's all jump. Right? That's not where you start. You start with doing a plie. And they show you how to put your feet and how to stand and how to do a plie. And it's very awkward and it doesn't look pretty. It looks like you're squatting. And it's not the thing, right? You go in to learn salsa. They're not going to put on the record and you're going to merengue and salsa the first minute. They put little shoes on the floor and they go, okay, let's go to one and two and one. There's a very, like, clear slow motion delineation so that you can figure it out. Now, there is that aspect of ABA sometimes that people will utilize DTT where they take a moment and they go, okay, we're going to break this down for you and we want you to touch the car. Yes, that's the car, right? But if that's all anybody is teaching, that's not good ABA. If, if they don't take that and eventually move that into the natural environment, Wave goodbye to these people who aren't teaching your child anything except if all you ever learned in the ballet class was the, you know, the, the plie, you wouldn't stay in that class. All ballet classes start with warming up and doing the ballet, you know, doing the, the plie, but then eventually you always get to the moment where we go across the floor and there's music and we're leaping. It's not going to be how it is in the end when you're doing it in a show, right? But we're starting to work on that skill. So we're starting to put it into the environment with the music, with other people, being spatially aware, doing all those things. Anytime you're teaching something uh, that is, has many steps to it, there is usually a step where it's really kind of awkward and basic and, all right, we're going to tear this down and, you know, if you're going to knit, it's like bring it around here and it's very pronounced so that you can get it and get it clear. But then eventually you speed it up, put it in the natural environment and practice it in the natural environment. They also don't do a ballet and go, okay, we're just going to do the plies and we're just going to go across the floor and now we're going to set it once and then we're going to go do the performance. No, they practice it a bunch of times. Why? Because then you, you get to work on it and get a little bit better each time. And it's the same thing with ABA. It's the same exact thing with ABA. They start sometimes, depending on the student, with something really rudimentary, but then they get a little bit more, and then they put it in the natural environment, and they practice, practice, practice in the natural environment so that eventually the person can go do the skill on their own. Good ABA utilizes the natural environment all the time, all the time. Uh, okay, ABA is not child driven. I love all now all these uh, places are because there's so many people who have so many bad things to say about ABA that all these other places are renaming things that they're doing and they're like, well, and this is child driven. And everybody goes, right, because ABA is not child driven. This is false. If ABA is not child driven, ABA, the very tenets of ABA say it's got to be individualized, which means we look at this individual child, what do they like? And we're going to start with what they like. If that's not child-driven, I don't know what is. I, we were just talking about this last night and um, with my son, and we were talking about when Peter Farrag first came to our door and what Peter would do. And, he, you know, before, any, before a therapist ever came to our door, they had us do this I mean, lengthy preference assessment that I had to fill out about every single thing that my son liked or disliked. And they actually read it. And Peter came in and knew that my kid was about Peter Pan and Pirates. We, uh, like, had watched the, the A&E a &E, um, Peter Pan with Kathy Rigby so many times. Uh, because a family friend of ours had directed it, and I love it. It's so good. And Jem, oh my gosh, he loved that thing, and he would watch it 12 times a day if you'd let him. And he just loved, 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 loved Peter Pan. But the, it was the recording of the live show with Kathy Rigby that was on Broadway. He didn't even know that his Uncle Glenn had directed it back then. Um, and, and I love when they redid it several years later when he was like eight or nine, 
um, they remounted it and he got to go and go backstage with Uncle Glenn and he got to meet Kathy Rigby. It was a big, big deal. But he loved, 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 loved pirates and he loved the whole swashbuckler thing and the, the, he loved the sword play thing. So Peter would come in and the first thing that he would do before every session, you know, he would greet my son and then he would sit down with construction paper and he would tear paper swords. Because, he, because they were going to play with the paper swords so that nobody could get hurt. And if you cut it, you can get a paper cut. But if you tear it, you can't. So, and they would get destroyed during the session. So he would tear two paper swords. And then he would hand one to my son and he would say, okay, buddy, you know, let's, let's do this. And they would start swashbuckling together. Um, and, and then Peter would freeze sometimes. And... And then, and Jem would be like dancing around him, trying to figure out how do I get the on button back on for this amazing, we, we refer, we, he, he looked like the genie in uh, Aladdin. So he, he was like, you know, just this boisterous and he had a big earring. It was just, you know, he looked like a genie and he was like, how do I turn the genie back on? And when his eyes, when my son's eyes would cross Peter's path, his eye line, it would be the start button and he would turn on. That was never discussed. It was never like, buddy, you have to make eye contact with me. It wasn't. It was just the on button. And they, and, and so it got reinforced and my son just did it more. That is child driven. That is the, <laughs> the very core of child driven. That's good ABA. And when people say to me, oh, well, ABA, the, child, the child never gets to play. I go, what are you talking about? If it's good ABA, they're playing all the time more than if you put them in a preschool. They're playing all the time in the natural environment uh, with things that they want to do and they're learning from it. That's some good ABA. Okay, uh, how about this one? Myth number eight, ABA is only for small children. It's a lie. It's a lie. The fact of the matter is, is that as I said earlier, ABA benefits anyone, the principles of ABA. I don't know if you realize this, and I'm going to talk about this on another slide, but ABA is used for so many other things than autism. It's just like in 2023, I think literally we, we've crested the mark where maybe 51% of ABA is autism related. That there's whole fields of ABA that have to do with business and other things. Um, so anybody can benefit from it. And the truth is for autism, we do know that children benefit from it, and there's a plethora of research about that, right? Uh, documented research, hundreds if not thousands of studies that show that ABA is effective at teaching children on the autism spectrum. That question has been asked and answered so many times. It exists, it's true. Um, now, the problem becomes that the research for children over the age of six is not as concise or um, extensive. In fact, it's really quite minimal, but there's anecdotal uh, evidence to show that it continues to be effective. And, uh, you know, this only makes sense because if you took a 44-year-old neurotypical business owner who said, I'm just having trouble in my life that I can't get past this point and I really wish that I could do this, and a, and a business coach sat there with him and said, okay, and used the principles of ABA and said, okay, what, what do you want? Uh, okay, are you willing to do this? And if you do this, let's check and see if it's working. And then, you know, and we'll make sure that we, you get the reward that you want for it, right? And then you will be more likely to do it. That's ABA. And people use this all the time in business. So of course it works on older individuals. Of course it does. And it's not that there is no research, it's just that there is a, so much anecdotal research. And the problem that we run into is that for kids who are young on the spectrum, what the early research showed, and it was replicated hundreds of times, that if you took kids between a certain age, between the ages of two and five, and if you gave them the right amount of good quality ABA, which meant 40 plus hours a week, everybody hang on because this is what the study said. I'm not making this up. If you gave them 40 hours a week of intensive, good quality ABA that was not traumatizing, but very child-driven, specific to them, unique to them, 
uh, what they needed to learn that within a two to four year period that roughly half of those kids would no longer qualify for their autism diagnosis that they would no longer qualify for the diagnosis of a disorder, that they would no longer need more support than any of us need. That's the truth. Everybody has a hard time with that, and it makes me crazy because that's the truth. I can send you the studies, right? But an insurance ended up having to start paying for it because that's the truth. That's why insurance started paying for ABA, because the documentation was there. Now, the problem being that when you are starting later with someone, let's say they're six, seven, or eight, you likely aren't, it's going to be much harder for you to get to the point where they don't need more support. So you're still making progress, but that individual may still need support and may need it their lifetime, or they might need 10 years, whereas before it was like, mm, we can get into two to four years and roughly 50% of these kids aren't going to need anything else. That's good bang for buck for insurance, right? It just is. But when we say that a seven-year-old who has not yet reached the point where they need, don't need support, and it might take five more years, that's a lot that insurance has to pay. So there's no funding for that research. It doesn't mean that it is impossible. It happens all the time. And the other happens where people don't reach the point where they, you know, uh, are like, <coughs> I need no support, but they've made tons of progress. Progress is progress. But when you're talking about who pays for it, everybody gets really, really sticky. And suddenly that turned into, oh, ABA only works for kids that are younger. That's a lie. It absolutely works at teaching skills for anybody, any age, any skill level. It just may take longer which costs the insurance companies more money. That should not be your problem. It, but it is effective for people who are older than small children. Okay, myth number nine, ABA is only used for autism. I, I've already covered this a little bit, but uh, you know, I put the skateboarder in there because Olympic athletes use ABA. Trainers of Olympic athletes use ABA. Uh, business coaches for Fortune 500 companies use the principles of ABA. Factories use the principles of ABA. Google uses the principles of ABA. <laughs> uh, Las Vegas slot machines use the principles of ABA. So hospitals with their employees and with their uh, patients use the principles of ABA. If you, this conference that I am at right now is the one that is, the one a year that is just for autism. Everybody will just be talking about ABA as it applies for autism at this conference. But I go to the other ones. The big one is in the, it's in Chicago every year. The, um, it's the weekend of Memorial Day. So I don't ever go to that one, but sometime if you're in Chicago, you should go and you, they, they used to put out a book. I'm sure it's all digital now, but they would put out a book, this thick book of all the presentations that were going to happen at their conference. And, you know, like 40% of it would be autism. And the rest of it would be on business and, and how to get, or, or Olympic athletes, how to get people to perform at the level that they want to. How can we be more effective? How can we... Uh, get, uh, achieve the things that we want to. I love Oprah, and Oprah, um, I'm, I'm now a part of her live your best life thing. It's all ABA, <laughs> Dr. Phil, all ABA. Um, it's about, he says, you know, what's your paycheck? That's all ABA, you guys. Uh, so it's, it's used for all kinds of things. It just happens to be that in the last 50 years, we saw that it was also effective with individuals on the autism spectrum. Uh, and as I said, the studies are there. Okay, the last one, and I'll try not to have my head fly all around the room. Uh, I think anytime we talk in absolutes, we're off the mark. And I hear people say things like, all ABA is bad, and it breaks my heart. And when I tell them, no, you know, I know that's not true. I know that my son had really good ABA. I didn't make that up. Um, I watched it. I was there for it. I saw it. And, and it wasn't bad. It was great. 
It was great. I referred to it as, as the miracle in my living room. Uh, and it was. And it was. And I feel very strongly about making sure that it still exists so that other people can find it. That's a really important thing to me. So I do get defensive, and I need to work on that when people say, oh, it's all bad. Um, but I also want to say that the opposite is, is also a problem, and I never want to be saying that all ABA is good. I know for a fact that it isn't. Now, I didn't always know that. I think my as assumption was, especially when we started this show 12 years ago, my assumption was that if somebody was getting ABA, that it was good and that they were getting it with the same principles in mind that I was getting. And that the parents had researched what I had researched to know what the principles were so that they were being watchdogs. Now, I have to admit to you that everything about ABA that we had in our home wasn't perfect. We had five years of ABA and during that five years, I personally fired five therapists. We called them therapists back then. Now you call them behavior technicians. It gripes me. But <laughs> Because <laughs> they're not—they're not working on cars. I don't—you I, know—I don't know what that is. But that's the phrase that they started. So okay, I'm going to use it. Behavior technicians. We fired five of them, and and you know, uh, it wasn't that they weren't good people. I didn't think that they were doing what we needed them to do with our son, and I didn't feel like they were following what we believed the science of ABA said very clearly. Um, and I said, no, no. You know, and, and I, with several of them, I said, you know, I either tried talking to them about it or talking to their supervisor and said, hey, this is where the disconnect is. And we gave them a period of time to attempt a difference. It was one that I didn't do that with, that I said, no, don't come back ever. Um, because I, I felt like she did something that was, uh, you know, the very beginnings of being traumatizing to my child. And I was not going to allow that. And I really want to empower every single parent within the sound of my voice to never allow people to treat your child as if they are less than or to do something that is just for the purpose of frustrating them. Um, Teaching is important, and, and sometimes when we're teaching, we will cause frustration, but it shouldn't be for a long period of time. These are little kids, and it should never be punitive. It's never their fault, right? So this whole idea of, I want you to know, I don't believe anymore that all ABA is good and that all ABA pr pr uh, practitioners are good. I did when we first started shows. And if you're watching when, in the early days of when we, we archived all the shows and you can watch all the shows and you can see that my tune has changed on this as I have learned, as I have grown, as I have heard stories, as I have sat with ABA professionals thinking that they were like-minded with me and found out that they weren't and went, <laughs> you know, um, now I know. This does not change the fact that there are still amazing people out there doing amazing ABA. And if we get to all of one or all of the other, we're going to miss the boat. Our kids are amazing. They should not have to be changed to be someone else's idea of something that's a setting on the dryer, normal, right? I don't, I don't care about normal. And if people care about normal, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what your criteria is for me or my son. If that is your criteria, normal, then I don't have any time for you. I'm not going to change their minds, right? So I am not asking my child to learn something to impress somebody whose house is down the block. That is, I, I'm just not interested in that. And I hope that you're not interested in that either. But what I always am interested in as a parent is making sure that my son has the skills he needs to do whatever it is that he wants to do. Not what I want him to do, what he wants to do. It's dicey though sometimes as a parent because I look at my son now and my son is a writer. I can assure you that my son is a writer. He writes stuff and I go, holy business. Uh, what a beautiful perspective and a beautiful, oh, oh, like, oh, I'm going to bring something in and read it sometime. He's a beautiful writer. But when he was a kid, 
That's the last thing on earth that he wanted to do was write. He didn't want to write, but it was because they were giving him a pen or a pencil to write. And that meant, you know, eye coordination and hand coordination and the brain communicating to and from. And, you know, but we didn't give up on writing. We just kept going, you know, how can we help him to access this in a way? And then, you know, there was a certain point when he was in fifth grade where by that point we had lobbied to get him a keyboard in the classroom and they gave him a prompt to write a poem and he wrote this poem that was earth shattering, earth shattering. And I, I was glad that we never gave up. I, I will tell you, I was teetering on the point of forget it. He's just not going to ever write. That's just not going to be his thing. And he still is not, you know, a handwriting person. He can do it, but it's not his favorite thing. It was not, neither was it my dad's. If I were to show you a piece of my, Dan's, my dad's handwriting, everybody said he should have been a doctor. He looked like he was filling out prescriptions. It was chicken scratch. You couldn't read it. My dad was brilliant. He was a television technical director. Brilliant. Um, and he didn't do a lot of handwriting, right? There is some handwriting, you, though, you need in life. And, and so we, you know, we finally got to the point where we we're like, well, we're not going to give up on it entirely, but we're going to give him the other way to communicate, and boy, did that pay off. My point is, um, it's hard sometimes. It's a fine line between uh, if you're going to teach a skill that is important to them long term and they're not liking it right now, it's hard, and I think it's individual for everybody. But I'm, I'm not one for torturing. I'm one for educating, and it's got to be meaningful. I prefer it if it's meaningful now, but sometimes it isn't, in which case you got to make it fair. So we did. We tried to make it as fair as possible. Anytime he had to write, he got big, huge rewards for doing it. I'm so glad we did that. I'm so glad we followed the principles of ABA and said, let's make it fair. But I, I understand that there are people who are uh, not doing good ABA. And I no longer carte blanche blindly support all ABA. But I do support the principles of ABA. And if somebody is acting upon the principles of ABA, it is life-changing for all individuals. You got something you want to change about how you move through your life, you want to learn a skill, you want to stop doing something that's harmful to you, check out the principles of ABA. It's wildly effective. Okay, now I'm sure that uh, <laughs> in the future we're having lots of uh, discussions online and I'm sure that there are a lot of you out there that have experienced ABA firsthand and that you're, you have much to say about the bad experience that you had. And here is the main thing that I want to say about that. I'm sorry. From the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry. I am sorry that someone didn't treat you with the respect that you deserve. I'm sorry that people put you in a position where you didn't understand what was happening and that they treated you as less than or created a world for you in which you felt that you didn't have the right to say no. You just have to believe me that that tears through me. It tears through me. But if we stop all ABA, out of the fear that that will happen to somebody, instead of being, I mean, vigilant watchdogs. What happens then? What happens to the kids who don't have a way to communicate because they are already fodder to the bad people because they don't have a way to say no and they don't have a way to say I'm uncomfortable and they don't have a way to say, help me. And, and if they never learn that, what happens then? I hope that you will write in and tell me how it is you want to teach those individuals. 
because that is what's at the core for me. I'm not clinging to a term, ABA. I'm clinging to the ability to teach people how to communicate their needs. And good ABA does that. It really does, and it's been shown to be more effective doing that than anything else. Sure, are other things effective at teaching? Yes. Um, I, I get really insane when, you know, ABA professionals kind of look down on things like dolphin therapy or equine therapy, and I'm like, really? If you think about it, it's really kind of in alignment with ABA. If a dolphin is really enforcing to a person, like a dolphin would be really enforcing to me. You put me in a tank with a dolphin, I will do my taxes to do that, right? Because it's that reinforcing to me. I will do the hardest thing. If you said to, I am afraid of heights, right? And if you said to me, Shannon, you can be in the tank with the dolphins, it would have to be for more than 15 minutes. I probably would be willing to scale off of a, a tall building for you because it would be that reinforcing to me. I would be willing to do something that would be hard for me so that I could be with the dolphins. And, you know, I see kids that when you put them in an environment that is really reinforcing to them, they light up and, and, and they are open to communicating and to finding different ways of communicating. So, but that's good ABA. If we meet them where they are, if we consider who they are, if we consider their experience, which means involving everything that is sensory for them. And we may not know, but we have to have all of our senses on to notice, okay, this person is showing signs of discomfort. I love, at the last autism conference I was at, uh, there was a, a professional who was lecturing who is a BCBA, but is also on the spectrum herself. And, and somebody was saying, well, how do you know with somebody who is, you know, has no functional communication? How do you know if it's, you know, driven by them? And she said, well, you know, people vote with their hands and their feet. Um, and I think that that's true. You know, if you're paying attention, you can see when a baby enjoys something. And you can see when a baby is not enjoying something. So to say that I can't tell what a six-year-old on the spectrum, whether they're enjoying something or not enjoying something to me, seems really non-communicative on that person's side, not on the seven-year-old side. Oh, you guys. Uh, I hope that this hit somewhere for those of you who needed to hear it. For those of you who are doing ABA, I want you to know that I am still a staunch supporter of ABA, um, but only the good stuff, only the stuff that is driven by what is fair and that takes the individual into consideration and follows the science of ABA. So much now is not following the science of ABA and doing these short, uh, you know, when we find out that the average kiddo who is getting ABA in this country is getting between 10 and 15 hours. I tell you, I, that's really horrible to me because if I'm trying to learn something um, and I don't get enough time and experience to learn it, I'm going to be stuck in the frustration thing longer. And that's the truth. And that's what a lot of our kids are. Uh, so make sure that if your prescription was written by the doctor for 30 hours, get the 30 hours. Lobby for it. Uh, find the good ABA. Be vigilant. Be diligent. Ask questions. Watch them working with your child. And make sure that it's the good kind because we don't want anybody else traumatized. All right. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for I can't tell. Am I, do I still have more time, Traven? Let me talk just a little bit about what's happening this week. I got five minutes. Ah, that's exciting. Don't miss out on the Autism Network podcast a thon. Remember, that's April 3rd through the, excuse me, April 4th through the 6th. It starts on the afternoon of the 4th. We will still, it's a Tuesday. We will still do the Ask Dr. Doreen live that morning, the regularly scheduled Ask Dr. Doreen. Then we'll take a few hours off. Hopefully, I'll be napping. And then we will come back at 3 o'clock and we will stay on the air for 44 hours. Internet willing. Um, 
you know, uh, we're going to do everything we can to stay live the whole 44 hours. So I hope that you'll tune in for that. It's all free. It's all free. We're lining up our experts that are going to be on. It's really, I'm excited about it. If I weren't going to be at it, I would want to go to it. And you can all go to it. It's on the internet. You don't have to take time off of work. At some point, they're going to let you go home from work. Excuse me, now I got the hiccups. Um, but you can watch whatever time you want to watch, and it will all be podcasted too. It won't just be live. You can catch up on it later on, and it's all free. Nobody's being charged anything to watch it. I love inspiration and information, and I'm calling this the information and inspiration extravaganza. No one else is, just me. Okay, this, uh, so this week, uh, today's President's Day. Tomorrow, we have Dr. Doreen Grampiche, and she's going to be joining us live from an undisclosed country in the Middle East. You can probably guess. Uh, but she, and we, so we're, we're praying to the internet gods for that, and we are hopeful that that will all go well. It will be late at night where she is, but we're very, very excited to have her from there. She's doing some really amazing work there with a, with a group of really amazing people. Uh, then on Wednesday, we have Kyle Jessel who's going to be joining us. He is known as the Driven Autism Dad, and you're going to want to tune in t to hear him. Uh, because he is a dad who looked at what was going on in his home, uh, six kids, two on the spectrum, and he said, I need to be a happier person and I need my kids to be a happier person, changed a bunch of things. Basically, uh, you know that part of the, the Martian where uh, Matt Damon says, well, I'm going to have to si science the crap out of this uh, to be able to stay alive? Well, this dad kind of said, I'm going to have to, you know, not science the crap out of this, but like find a system, which is kind of scientific, for us to be able to lead our lives and be happy and de-escalate these tantrums and move on with our life. And he's got some great advice about how he moved, rearranged his life and how much happier everybody is as a result, how you can meet your kid where they are, how you can take all of the you know, negative energy out of the tantrums so that you can be there and be a good parent for your kiddos. So that's going to be on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, Moira Giamatteo is here for our last Let's Talk Movies before our big Oscar show. So that's going to be really cool. We're going to finally review some of the movies that we've been kind of talking about, like RRR. The top of my head's going to come off and fly around the room and sparklers are going to come out. But uh, lots of movies that we're going to be doing there. And then on Friday, again, is Stories from the Spectrum. We hope that you're supporting that podcast. It's a really important podcast. It is all content by and for individuals who identify themselves as being on the spectrum, having autism, being autistic, or being neurodivergent or neurodiverse, whatever words they use. Uh, they are... It is their segments to say what they want. They get paid for doing these segments. We think it's really important, and we would love to see more people liking and sharing and, and more eyeballs on that program because we feel that it warrants it. Uh, and we want to keep doing it as long as we possibly can. And sponsors won't sponsor it until you guys like, share, do, do your thing on that. So we appreciate it if you would do that for us. So that's what we have coming up next week. And a lot of really great guests. I, I want to tease that the week after on uh, May 1st, we've got really some amazing stuff. Uh, March 1st, not May 1st. Hello. Uh, talk about fast forwarding. On March 1st, you guys have been asking for a feeding expert, and we're having a feeding expert that's going to be joining us on March 1st. So you're not going to want to miss that. So make sure that you mark that down in your calendar. I think that we are about out of time, but Traven is showing you on the screen right now our, uh, uh, you know, our different handles and things. I always want to remind you that if you need more information about anything, the best place to go is to our website, autismnetwork.com. All of our shows and when they air and, and the latest editions of them are all available there. You can find the link tree there to find out where the podcasts are. It's all on our website, autismnetwork.com. And soon there will be the schedule, because uh, it's shaping up quite lovely, for that Autism Network podcastathon. That's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> so. You guys, I'm sending you love. I hope that you have a really wonderful President's Day, 
and that you find some time today to do something really remarkable. I'm, I'm at a hotel right on the beach, so I am, gonna, I am making a pledge that I'm going to walk on the beach today. Uh, one way or the other, because I don't ever get the chance to do that. So I hope that you do something like that for you. We'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Grant Pichet live from overseas. Until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.